Man, how beautiful is that? The team, yeah, that was, yeah, incredible. Thank you guys so much. Uh, the reason that we, we chose that song to kind of lead into the message today is because that's sort of the reminder, that's the mantra. You know, so often we can get caught in the hustle and bustle of life and the regular routines and all the things that just kind of jockey for our time that we maybe forget that we were meant to live for so much more. We are called to such a higher plane of existence than just being, right? And God has a crafting and a, a, a calling and a design for each of us. And we're gonna get into that today. So my, my name is uh, Sam Anderson. I'm a teaching pastor here at Kensington and I'm just super excited to be with the East Sider CT family today. Super glad to be here. Um, we're gonna wrap up the fourth week of our series that we've been in the past, you know, three weeks, this do this and more. And we've been hanging out in the book of First Thessalonians, which uh, the book of First Thessalonians is essentially a letter that this guy Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. So Paul was this first century church planner. He traveled with Silas and Timothy and a couple of his homies. And they would go into a city and they would talk about Jesus and then they would start a church there. And they would hang out there for a few weeks to a month, maybe a few months, depending on the situation. And then they would go somewhere else and start another church. And while they were starting that other church, they'd write letters back of, hey, here's some things that can help. Here's some ways that you can grow and develop in your faith journey. Here's some things that I hear you're struggling with. Let me help you with that. And so most of our New Testament, which is the second half of our Bible, most of that is comprised of these kinds of letters, right? The uh, first and second Corinthians are the letters written back to the church in Corinth. Romans, the church in Rome. Uh, Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. Galatians, the church in Galatia, right? Thessalonians is the church in Thessalonica. And so Paul is writing back to them, giving them sort of a challenge, but also celebrating. That's what's kind of unique about the book of First Thessalonians, this letter that Paul writes. It's, it's chocked full of encouragement because these people are doing it right. They're doing a great job. They're spreading the message of Jesus with power and effective, uh, effectiveness. He says um, that they, they were influencing the believers of Macedonia and Achaia, right? These neighboring cities and their whole region was becoming transformed with the gospel of Jesus because of the way that they were taking it in and then reflecting it out. And so the, over the past several weeks, we've spent time sort of digging into that. And so in week one, we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 which gave us a lot of context and we looked at a lot of the history and the region and the geography and all these different things of sort of laying the foundation for the rest of the, season, of, of the series. And we talked about this, how this book is full of challenge but also celebration. And we looked at the idea of Macedonia and Achaia and how these places are being transformed for Jesus. And so we said, okay, well, in week two, let's kind of unpack that. Why are they having such an impact? Why are they changing their region? Why are they, they leading people to Jesus and it's causing life change and transformation? What are they doing? How are they engaging with the word of God? And so in week two, we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter one, verses five through seven. And it says that they received the message of Jesus through word, through power, and through the Holy Spirit with much conviction. And so when we looked at that, we kind of broke it down and said, okay, well, here's how they're engaging with the gospel. Here's how they're engaging with the good news of Jesus. Gospel means good news. So if you're ever talking about Jesus and it's a bummer, it's not the gospel, right? Because gospel means good news, the good news of Jesus. How are they wrestling with this? It says in word and power and in spirit. And so this word, we looked at this idea that they're engaging with this thing in their cerebral, right? They're wrapping their head around it. They're not checking their brain at the door when they engage the message of Jesus, if a church or you know, situation ever asks you to check your brain at the door and they're saying stuff and you're like, wait a second, right? Be very cautious. They accept it in word. They wrap their head around it. They ask questions. They embrace doubt. They really went into the weeds of the cerebral with this understanding of who Jesus is, but it didn't stop there. They didn't get so caught up in the weeds that they didn't move to power. Understanding the presence, the supernatural presence of God. So they went from a head knowledge to a heart knowledge. And then once they were able to wrap their heart around it and experience the presence of God, then they went through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit with much conviction and started sharing this with other people. And so there was this holistic approach to the good news of Jesus. And so they were super effective. And so then in week three, we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 
and said, okay, how were they so effective? So they, you know, they came and they shared and he's encouraging them. They're doing a great job. Week two, it's like, okay, well, how did they receive this? This is how they received it. They got their head in. They got their heart in. They received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So how did they then engage with other people? Like, how did, how did that all work? What was that dynamic like? And so when we looked at chapter four, verse nine and 10, it focuses on how they loved one another, right? And the passage is pretty clear. It's like, you know, if you don't know, uh, if you don't know God, then you don't know love because God is love. That's, that's a big deal. Love is everything. Love is central to everything. Love is the whole thing, right? God is love. And it says that he loved us before we even loved him. He gave us this unconditional love. When we were still in the junk of life, still in the messiness of life, still in all the you know, conundrums we find ourselves in, he showed us love. He loved us unconditional. And it says, Paul says when he writes in this passage, he says, listen, I don't even have to write you guys about love. He said, you guys are knocking it out of the park. You're doing incredible at loving other people. And he says, well, why? Because you learned from God. You're reflecting the same kind of love that God gave to you, right? And we're so quick to receive the love of God. We're like, yes, God, give me all the love. Yes, mm, glory, double portion. Won't he do it, Right? Come on, Jesus, all that unconditional love. Look past all my junk, look past all my sins, look past all my shortcomings. But then when it comes to reflecting it to others, we're like, yeah, mm, mm, I don't know. I don't think I want to do that, right? Right? And so Paul's like, of course you guys are making a big impact because you're receiving the love just like you're, or you're reflecting the love just like you're receiving it. And we looked at this idea that we are called to love people unconditionally like God loves us unconditionally. That means practically that there are no qualifiers or quantifiers for us to love others. Doesn't matter what kind of flag they have hanging in front of their house, this way or the other. That shouldn't be a determining factor whether we love them like Jesus loves them, right? They don't have to look like you or think like you or believe like you or dress like you or, or you know, have the same convictions as you and the same life choices as you. You love them unconditionally just like God loved you unconditionally. And the Thessalonians were doing that and it was powerful and it was impactful and it was transforming and shifting and changing their entire region. And so we've been on this journey with the Thessalonians and so today what I wanna do is I wanna spend a few moments in 1 Thessalonians chapter two, verses five through 12. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. That's where we're gonna be today. If not, it'll be up on the screen. But I wanna learn from the approach that they had when they shared the gospel. Their approach of making this, ex like, attainable for others, acceptable for others, in, within reach of others, the approach that they took. Because I think we can put the same approach to work in our own lives and we can experience the same kind of exponential results that they did. I think we can be a little bit systematic about it. And I think it can be super powerful for each and every one of us. So we're gonna do that. But before we jump in, let's pray and sort of focus our hearts to receive from God this morning. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all the talented and gifted individuals who are up here leading us in praise and worship and adoration of who you are. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come to a space like this and to sing songs of praise to you. Thank you for the freedom we have to open your word and allow it to speak truth to us. We ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit now to soften our hearts, to open our minds, to make us receptive to whatever you have for us today. Help, these, help this text to come alive to us. We ask that it would... It would plant seeds in our heart and bear fruit in our life. That we leave this morning encouraged, edified, challenged, and changed. We love you, we praise you, we adore you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. Listen, before we jump in, we do like to pause and just thank those of you who have partnered with us through your consistent giving and your generosity. As the ushers want to come forward, we, just, we take the opportunity every time to say thank you because everything that we do here at Kensington is only made possible because of your generosity because of what you consistently pour in to the mission and vision that God has given this church. And so we like to pause and we like to say thank you, but then we also like to invite you to join us if you have it. And so there's easy ways to do that. They're all up on the screen. You can text to give, you can give on the app, you can give online, uh, or they're passing around the magic bags here in the room. I think if you put in $2, you get a dove, $3, you get a rabbit. I think that's kind of how it works, but uh, no, I'm kidding. But seriously, all, 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 the, all of your partnership is what makes it possible for us to have, you know, 50 plus move out teams, for us to have, you know, the 11 global partners that we have, all the local, regional, global ministry that takes place. I mean, even the stuff that happens in building, 
right? Like the middle schoolers over here, this service, learning age appropriately who Jesus is and what he can mean to them in their crazy middle school world, in their crazy middle school brain with crazy middle school language, right? Like that's made possible. The, the high schoolers coming in tonight and getting a safe haven, a safe place to learn and, and, and interact with Jesus. All of our kids, I mean, I got six kids back there in the, in the kids' church right now. I am so grateful and thankful for what they're doing back there to lay a foundation in my kids that can last them their entire life, right? And so all of that stuff's made possible because of you guys. And we just, we like to just pause and say thank you, honor you, and then, uh, yeah, invite you to join us. So thank you guys for that. We really, really appreciate it. So we are in, um, yeah, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 through 12. But before we get there, I do, I want to start with a little bit of a bummer. Um, it wouldn't be right for me to speak here without trying to fill up Adam Karshner's email uh, with all of your thoughts from what I say, right? It would be a missed opportunity if I didn't do that. So I do want to start, though, with this idea that oftentimes Christians get a bad rap. Would you agree? Oftentimes Christians get a pretty bad rap. I mean, we have consistently, we have like these TV preachers. Any of you guys ever see TV preachers before? Did anyone else grow up with, uh, I think the guy's name was Robert Tilton. I think that was his name, where he'd like put his hands up and you'd put your hands on the screen for healing Anyone? Has anyone? Anybody? I just got shocked every time I did. I was like, Bzz, right? Like, oh, it must be Jesus, right? <laughs> I had carpet, and I'm like, Bzz, 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 you know, Holy Spirit, yes. Um, but, you know, we get a bad rap because those are the people that people see. They see these guys that are like, buy my prayer cloth for $29.99. It has the blood and the tears of Mary, actual Mary. And you're like, what? How is that even possible? He's like, it's real. Wait. If you order now, you get two for the price of one. And, you know, you get the whole, the whole deal. Or if you've seen any of these, like, televangelist people, they have, a comer like they have a three-point sermon, and at every point of their sermon, they pause for a commercial break to sell their book or sell their pamphlet or sell their prayer cloth or their anointing oil. And you're like, what is going on here, man? Like, is this just like a big money-making operation? It's like, yes, yes, actually it is. And so I feel like Christians get a bad rap. Before they even meet anybody who actually follows Jesus, that's kind of what they see. Or they hear all the church scandals that take place, right? Like TMZ loves to put us on blast, you know? I remember years ago, gosh, I don't even remember how many years ago, but like the whole Ted Haggard thing. You know, oh, dang, he's singing names? Yeah, like the whole Ted Haggard thing, right? That happened out in Colorado. Just a few weeks before that, he was on like 2020 with Barbara Walters, just talking about Jesus and like knocking these answers out of the park. I'm like, okay, Ted, get it, Ted. And then he was like getting it, you know? It came out a couple weeks later, like, whoa, Ted, chill, right? I mean, and you got like Ravi Zachariah, who's got like this, Zacharias or whatever, he's got like this whole thing in the postmortem, you find out, holy smokes, that guy was what? Doing what with who, what, huh? Right? I mean, we, we hear these things all the time. You got the, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast that comes out talking about the toxicity happening over on the West Coast with Mark Driscoll and his whole thing. You got, uh, you know, the Willow Creek stuff, our neighbors in Chicago, that thing imploding and exploding and all the things going down. You got Hillsong Church, right? All the pastors are like walking away or getting asked to leave and all the Hillsong. Who's Hillsong? Like, bro, you know who Hillsong is. Everybody's trying to put like distance. Like, ah, I never talk. I never watch that. Ugh, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? All these things, man. And then you have like the Catholic church. I won't even go there, but like for all of history, right? Like that's a thing. And so like, like I said, if you have issues, email me adam.karshner at kensingtonchurch.org. Love to hear your thoughts on what I'm saying right now. It'd be great. But uh, to be honest, <laughs> it can be a little overwhelming, right? It can be a little daunting. It can be a little like downright depressing. You know, as a pastor, I'm like, I am not those guys. Those guys are not me. And you know this, when people find out you're a Christian at work, they're like automatically assume you're super judgmental, you hate everybody, you're a bigot and everything else, right? Like, you're like, eh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You don't really think, because we get a bad rap. We really do. Because of the, the, it's like we're qualified by the least of us, right? The crazies are the ones that everyone associates with who we are and what we are. And so, you know, we got all these people that are preaching on a platform and then they're like scumbags in real life. And people see that and they're like, yeah, I don't want nothing to do with that. Not interested. Not for me. And that's why I love that Paul includes in this, in this letter of the Thessalonians, he includes the way that they are sharing the gospel. 
He includes the way that they're going about it. They're not standing up in front of crowds and being like, oh, look at how great I am and how great Jesus is and buy my book and my prayer cloth and all these things, right? Buy this stone that was thrown at Stephen. It's gonna be awesome. You should do it. $29.99, two for 50, right? That was not going down. And Paul includes that. He's like, this is not the way it is. Let me tell you how we shared the gospel. Let me tell you, let me give you sort of an outline for your evangelism. What this should look like for you to share Jesus with others, for you to make this a lifestyle and make this something that's contagious to others. And so he kind of lays that out there. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, again, this is what Paul's saying. This is what he's talking about. He says this. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. He's like, on God. This is true, on God, right? Verse 6. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers and sisters, our labor and toil. We worked night and day, that we, might not burden, to, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless, blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul lays out in seven verses here, he's basically saying, this is how we do it, right? This is what he's saying. He's saying, this is how you do it. This is how you share Jesus with others. He said, this is how we did it. This is how you need to do it. In verse five, he says, we didn't come at you like a used car salesman. No offense to any used car salesman in the room. Y'all get a bad rap too. A little more deserving than pastors, but we're just gonna go with it. Basically, he comes in, he says, we're not trying to sell you anything. We didn't come at you trying to sell you anything saying, hey, 29, two for 50, you, you know, whatever. Like he didn't, he, we didn't come at you like that. And then in verse six, he says, we're not seeking fame. We're not seeking celebration or glory. He's like, we could have, we could have come in like that, but we didn't. That wasn't our posture. That wasn't our attitude. See, back in the day in the Roman empire, it was totally normal for orators or philosophers to travel from town to town and to give like a well-polished, you know, manicured speech of their brilliance and, and, you know, class and style. And they would go through and they would do this to try and generate followers. People saying, ooh, I like what he's saying. I want to be like him. I want to travel with him. And then they would have to foot the bill for this philosopher or this orator or whatever. He'd get a little posse of disciples who were then responsible to take care of him. And the bigger his posse got, the more money he got, the more fame he got, the more fortune. And so it was normal for people to travel from town to town, village to village, trying to amass sort of a crew to take care of them financially and make them famous. And Paul says, that was not us. That's not how we came at you. We didn't come at you puffing you up and trying to sell you anything. We didn't come looking for money or for glory or for fame or any of that. And then in verse seven, he says, we were gentle. And then he uses this motherly imagery of like a mother taking care of her children, sustaining life, giving them food. We were gentle in our approach. Think about that. How often is that used to describe our evangelistic approach? Gentle. How about your social media evangelistic approach? Gentle? Probably not. Paul says, this is how you do it. We didn't come in trying to sell you on anything. We didn't come in acting like we're all this and all that, and you need to follow us, and we're gonna be rich and famous, and it's gonna be... No, we came in gentle, like a mother taking care of her baby. And then in verse eight, he goes on. He says, we shared the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus. But then he says, we also shared ourselves. It wasn't just about preaching and putting on this big performance and then skirting off into the night and doing whatever we want to do. He said, we shared the gospel and ourselves. There was relationship. There was this idea that that we, we loved you. We cared for you. We were in this together. It wasn't just a show. It wasn't just, and it was real It was authentic. They were doing life together. We shared the gospel and we shared ourselves. And so that makes us kind of rethink this like parachute evangelism stuff where we 
drop into the inner city and, oh, we're going to solve all your problems, and then we're back in the suburbs the next week. Right? We shared the gospel and we shared ourselves. There was relationship there. There was continuity there. There was authenticity there. And then in verse 9, he goes on and he says, basically, we worked our tail off when we were with you. Like, we worked hard, long hours in the toil, right? We were, we were going at it. Basically, what he's saying is we didn't come in taking anything from you. We didn't come being takers. We came with the posture of trying to be givers. We wanted to be a blessing rather than a burden. We wanted to come with something positive for you. We didn't want to just continually be making withdrawals. We wanted to come and make deposits. Because the reality is, Paul and Silas and Timothy and their whole crew, their whole squad that they had that were traveling, starting these churches and stuff, they could rightfully expect the new converts to take care of them. Right? Like I said, these philosophers and these orders that are traveling, it would be normal that if you become a follower, you start supporting them. And so they could easily have shown up and said, all right, y'all, you guys believe in Jesus? Sweet. Now go ahead and kiss my pinky ring, get me some grapes, and get a nice little palm branch you can wave over my head. Right? But he says, that's not it. We came in and we worked our tails off with you, side by side, co-laborers. You know, in other parts of scripture, it talks about them being tent makers. Like they were building houses essentially to fund what they were doing because they wanted to be a blessing to the people, not a burden. He says, this was our approach. This is how we did things. And then in verse 10, he goes on and he says, and we walked the walk. He says, on God, we walked the walk. He said, you know this, God knows this. He says, our conduct was holy. It was righteous. It was blameless. We were good people. Not just on stage, but in real life. We were actually doing the things that we were talking about doing. It was a matter of character and conscious. He says, this is what we were doing. And then in verses 11 and 12, he says, and we exhorted you, we encouraged you, we charged you. And again, he uses the imagery of a father. He says, we walked in a manner worthy of God. He uses this familial imagery again. He says, the mother who is gentle and who takes care, but then the father who also kind of pushes you along a little bit, encourages you, challenges you, exhorts you to keep going. And so reading through this, a few things stood out to me this week, right? I'm like, okay, cool. This is like a roadmap for evangelism. This is like a roadmap for what it looks like to share the gospel. This is what they did for the Thessalonians, and then this is obviously what the Thessalonians did for others, and there was this massive response where they transformed the entire region as a result. And everybody's looking to them going, man, they're knocking it out of the park. How do we do what they're doing? I want to be a part of what they got going on. And so this roadmap, I took out, what, one, two, three, four different things that I think that we can apply to ourselves. Four different ideas that we can say, man, if we put these into practice, I think we'd see exponential results in sharing our gospel and sharing our faith and sharing our life with others. And the first one is this, authenticity and realness. Being real, being authentic. Don't approach people like projects. People are not projects. And when you view them that way, they know it. You're not fooling anybody. Don't approach people like projects. It says in verse five, we never came with words of flattery. We never came in buttering you up and like, ooh, all right, we're gonna get them just right in the right spot, right in the right place, and then poof, drop the hammer of, of, of Jesus on them, right? And convert them and get them baptized. Like, people are not projects. Don't, don't, don't come at it like that, right? People are not resources either. I think the church struggles with that a lot, right? People are not resources. And when you, they know when you think that they are. They know when you treat them like they are. It said in verse six, nor with a pretext of greed. We didn't come to this thing seeing what can we get out of you, right? You don't wanna meet somebody who's a good singer and be like, oh man, you're a good singer. You should really come sing at my church, let me leverage you as a resource to the, ch to the church, to the faith community, to the, you know? I mean, ultimately, yeah, we hope they bring their talents, gifts, and abilities, but we need to see them as a person. We need to be real and authentic. I feel like too often Christians get this wrong. We view people as projects. We view people as resources. We don't view people as people and love them as people, serve them as people, connect with them as people. And so I think that's super important. I think that's what they did here in Thessalonica. Authenticity. Realness. The second thing is this familial language that they use, this idea of family. I mean, this really stuck out to me this week as I was kind of wrestling through this, right? In verse seven, it uses this mother imagery, taking care of her children, you know, feeding, sustaining life. And then verse 11, this father imagery where we exhort and we encourage and we challenge and we kind of push them forward a little bit. 
for me, it made me think, man, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, this is the sort of the community that we need to cultivate as the church. This family, this interdependence, this reliance on one another, this I got you and you got me, and we're going at this thing together. You're my brother, you're my sister. If you're a little further along the journey, you become a mother and a father, and you find someone earlier in the journey, and you pour in, you love, you nurture, you push them along, just like a mother, just like a father, right? That's the goal, that's the vibe of this faith community idea. That, that's, that's the deal, is to cultivate this familial connection, this faith community, doing life together. And so I thought that was huge. I thought, man, yeah, that's, that's powerful. If we make people feel like they're belonging to a family, that deep of a sense of belonging, that deep of a sense of trust, of nurturing, of caring, of loving, people say, yeah, I want... Because we got some messed up families, right? We can say, oh man, I want, I want some of that. I want some of what they got going on, right? And so that stood out to me. The whole authenticity and realness, the whole familial language thing. The third thing is the hard work. Being givers, not takers. I think that's massive. In verse five, he says, no flattery or greed. Verse six, he says, no demands or expectations. And then in verse nine, he says, we worked hard. Listen, as Christ followers, we should aim to be a blessing, not a burden. You shouldn't show up to the water cooler and everyone else vacates the area at work. Right? Like, oh, great, here comes Susie. Going to lay all of her problems on me today and disguise them as prayer requests. <laughs> come on, Susie, cut it out. Right? We don't need to be a burden to everybody we come to. Have you guys ever seen those memes where uh, the raccoon's digging in the trash and the guy walks up and he's like, hey, I'd like to introduce you to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then it like takes off running. You guys, no, no. You need to watch it. It's hilarious, okay? But is that how people feel about us? Oh gosh, here comes that Christian. We need to be a blessing to people, not a burden to people. We need to make deposits with people, not consistently withdrawing from people. And I know there's different seasons and there's gonna be seasons where you need more withdrawal, you need more love, you need more help, but hopefully leading up to that, you've made a bunch of deposits so you're not walking around relationally in the negative all the time, right? We need to work hard. We don't need to be a burden to those who we're interacting with. We don't need to be a burden to those who we're trying to commingle with and trying to lead to Jesus. It doesn't need to be some tiresome negative thing. We need to be givers, not takers. And then the fourth thing that comes out, I think, is the biggest of them all. I feel like it's the secret sauce. It's a secret sauce that the Thessalonians knocked out of the park and had exponential results. And I think it's this, doing life together. I think that's huge doing life together. In verse eight, it says, we shared the gospel and we shared ourselves. We shared the gospel and we shared ourselves. And then in verse 10, it says, we walked the walked, right? Holy, righteous, and blameless conduct. We shared the gospel and we shared ourselves and we walked the walk. We did it with you. See, I love referring to churches and whatnot as faith communities because faith is so important. But if you're only talking faith, you're missing half the equation. Because community is so important. But if you're only talking community, you're missing half the equation. But a faith community is the sweet spot. That's the secret sauce. It's doing life together while challenging and encouraging each other to follow Jesus, to have this familial bond, this brother, sister, mother, father type of relationship. Making more deposits than withdrawals. Working hard together. Doing life together. See, nobody cares about the sermons that I preach, if I'm being honest, being self-realizing here. Two to three weeks, I can say, hey, what was my third point two weeks ago? I don't know, right? Nobody cares about the sermons I preach. You know what they care about? How I treat my wife and kids out in the lobby. They care about how I treat the waitress when I go out to lunch. They care about the way I interact with people Monday through Saturday, not just for two hours on Sunday morning. That's the reality. They care about how I act, how I interact when I'm doing life with them. That's what they care. I can get up here and say whatever I want to say, but am I living it? Am I actually doing it? You see, the reality is we don't need a sage from the stage. We need a guide from the side. We don't need a sage from the stage. We need a guide from the side. We need people to do life 
with us. You can say anything in a cute prepackaged Facebook quote, but are you actually walking with those people? Are you actually being the hands and feet of Jesus with them and for them? Thessalonians, man, he says it plain and clear. He says, yo, you know, we made the gospel available to you, but we made ourselves available to you as well. And I think that is the secret sauce, is doing life together. We want to impact our region, impact our job, impact our, our family. We need to do life together. Pointing people to Jesus like that. Not a sage from the stage, but a guide from the side. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes, right? The band's going to lead us in this next song called Simple Kingdom. It talks about just, God, we want to be available to you and operate the way that you've called us to operate, do the things that you've called us to do. And as they lead us in that, I got a couple questions that I want you to wrestle with. The first is this, and these are gonna be a little vulnerable, a little tough to wrestle with, but the first one is this, am I authentic and real? Starting right with just a kidney punch, like right away, right? Am I authentic and real? Or do I put on a show? Am I just fronting? Does it look good on Facebook and then in real life, it's not. Am I honest? Am I raw? Are you really you? Do you actually care about people? Do you see people for who they are? Do you see people where they are and meet them there? Are you authentic? Are you real? The second question, am I fostering a familial culture, right? Am I fostering a faith family feel? Am I fostering this interdependency where people can rely on me and I can rely on them? And when the storms seem like they're coming from every direction, we can stand back to back and we can get this thing because we've invested in one another. We've connected with one another. Am I living in this familial culture? Am I fostering that with my sphere of influence? Third question, am I depositing more than I'm withdrawing? Am I depositing in my faith community more than I'm withdrawing? Am I depositing in my relationships more than I'm withdrawing? Am I depositing in my marriage more than I'm withdrawing? Am I depositing with my kids more than I'm withdrawing? Am I depositing in those who I'm trying to point to Jesus more than I'm withdrawing? Are you working your tail off to be a blessing, not a burden? Think about it. Are you the person when you walk to the water cooler, everyone else walks away? Am I depositing more than I'm withdrawing? Am I being more of a blessing than a burden? And then the final thought, the final question to wrestle with this morning is, am I doing life with other people? Am I doing life with others? Am I sharing meals with other people? Am I inviting people into my home? When people invite me into their home, am I thinking of every single possible excuse not to go or am I accepting the invitation? Am I making myself available and vulnerable to do life with others? Am I celebrating with others at the highest heights and am I battling and struggling with others at the lowest of lows? Am I doing life with other people or am I trying to travel this journey alone? Because the reality is the call to follow Christ was never meant to be done alone. It was always intended to be done in community. And I think the Thessalonians got that. The Thessalonians did these things they were authentic and real. They had a familial culture. They were depositing more than withdrawing. They were doing life together and there was an exponential impact. People saw that and said, yeah, mm -hmm, I wanna be part of that. I don't, yes, mm, whatever you're saying, yes. Whatever you're doing, yeah, I, I'm in. I, I just wanna come too. I just wanna be around that. I wanna experience that for myself. And so they grew exponentially. They grew exponentially. And so imagine if we start doing this, if we started doing these things and got serious about this, if we started living out what verses five through 12 say in 1 Thessalonians chapter two. We use that roadmap for a roadmap of evangelism, a roadmap for people to connect with Jesus. Like I said, the Thessalonians did it and it changed their world. And I believe that we can do it too. And it could literally change our world. Start with your... PTO at your school, right? Start with your little cul-de-sac. Start with your little neighborhood. Move to the block, right? To your city, to your region, to churches. I mean, exponentially it can grow. But it starts with you and it starts with me. 
He said, we're going to take this thing seriously. Thessalonians did it and it worked. I think it can work for us too. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the truth that it gives us, the guidance, the encouragement, the challenge that it gives us. God, over these next few minutes as we wrestle, Lord, I pray for those of us who are wrestling with this concept, are we authentic? Are we the real us? Are we raw? Are we honest? God, send your Holy Spirit to give us mercy and grace in these moments, but also the audacity to do something about it. God, as we wrestle with this idea of familial culture, are we posturing ourselves in a way to foster this? God, are we making more deposits than withdrawals? Are we a blessing to people more than a burden? And God, are we doing life with people? Are we traveling this journey, not a sage from the stage, but a guide from the side, doing life side by side with them? God, maybe in these next few moments, you illuminate ways that we need to surrender, that we need to change. And you give us the strength and the courage and the audacity to make the change. God, we invite you to do a work in us over these next few minutes and moving forward. God, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Go ahead and stand and worship with us.